Hello friends, I am Manish Anand. At the risinghills.com, it is our endeavor to bring curated contents for you uh, that uh, adds to meaningful discourse and discussions in, our, in the events which take place. In Tashkent, uh, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting was held uh, in which the Indian Foreign Minister as Jai Shankar participated. Today, we are going to discuss uh, the outcome of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization's uh, foreign ministerial meeting with our senior colleague, uh, veteran uh, uh, journalist, uh, Ramananda Sengupta. Ram, uh, welcome uh, to the show. Hi. Uh, how are you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. And uh, uh, friends, uh, Ram is joining us from Chennai. Uh, uh, let me introduce you. He is a veteran strategic affairs journalist. He has been a foreign affairs editor with several publications. And on foreign relations, he is an authority in the Indian media. So uh, uh, one more thing I would like to add, Ram, in fact, that gives me a lot of uh, uh, pride that uh, one of the research uh, article by Ram was uh, uh, on Arctic's uh, significance in the strategic sense uh, was followed by none other than the Economist, uh, one of the topmost world magazine. So Ram, what we have seen that, uh, uh, that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting, the principal mandate of this grouping was to counter terrorism. So let me begin with uh, on this topic because uh, Bilawal Bhutto was also present in the meeting and uh, there was no, of course, there was no bilateral between Jay Shankar and Bilawal Bhutto. Still, how does uh, the SEO fare on this principal mandate on countering terrorism? Um, you see, terrorism now, the interesting part here is that Bilawal, of course, he wasn't supposed to meet Jay Shankar, but I think he never met uh, uh, Lavrov either. He was supposed to meet the Russian foreign minister as a, as a host. But I think everybody, every other foreign minister met Lavrov except Bilawal. I mean, that is significant in some ways, though they are trying to say that, you know, scheduling difficulties or something like that. But there was a, you know, uh, that which I'm, I'm trying to understand why Bilawal was not given some time. Normally, this is just a courtesy call. But uh, I'm surprised that Bilawal never got the chance to meet uh, Lavrov. Now, you know, if I can just put it into context, we're just talking about terrorism. We, Jay Shankar, as you know, went and said that, you know, terrorism and all its form must be stopped. Um, Bilawal in his speech kept saying that, you know, Islamophobia is what is preventing India from sort of, you know, that India is scared that if it goes, on, it goes into a discussion with Pakistan, that we will have problems vis-a-vis -vis the so-called, you know, uh, the problems we have with uh, Muslims in our country, which, I mean, a lot of people seem to be taking that up in a big way. Now, I personally think that um, it's very obvious where terrorism comes from in the world. I mean, there is nobody has to explain that. Of late, however, of late, I'm noticing that um, while India has been putting constant pressure on Pakistan, saying that you know this is the epicenter of terrorism, this is the epicenter of whatever what is going on, a lot of the thing has shifted to Afghanistan, and that is a bit you know uh, that gives Pakistan you know uh, what, what is called plausible deniability that oh it wasn't us you know that the terrorists came from Afghanistan. Now here's the thing: terrorism is just one part of what is going on there. Right? At the meeting, China made this, uh, sorry, Pakistan made this remark about extending CPEC to Afghanistan. Now, that is obviously going to get the Indian Babu very upset because, you know, they've been saying CPEC itself is illegal. And India has a lot of interests in Afghanistan. So if you were to now put, uh, and a lot of those interests involve, you know, infrastructure, roads and, you know, rail lines and things like that, apart from buildings and stuff. So now you're going to have, if, if, if CPEC actually ex does extend to Afghanistan, it's not going to be very difficult for the Chinese to sort of, you know, uh, put the thing in because the Chinese have been in touch with the Taliban for a very long time. They have a lot more contact with the Taliban than we do. You know, we have recently said, okay, we'll talk. But, you know, the Chinese have been talking to the Taliban for the past 20 odd years. 
and they've already set in place a lot of, you know, they paid off a lot of people in order to start laying roads and things like that. So all they have to do is to just rename it and say that look, this road that we built, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, is already part of CPEC. Now, why would they want it? Because the only way to get things out of Central Asia is through Afghanistan. Central Asian, most of the Central Asian republics are landlocked. The only way they can come to a port is through the, you know, Afghanistan, then down to either Pakistan or Iran or wherever it is that they can. So for Pakistan, that could be a great win to be able to, you know, say that, okay, look, we are part, even Afghanistan is a part of it. So I don't know how India wants to tackle that because I don't think you can really force the Taliban to say, no, you can't you know, join the CPEC. But I found that a bit interesting because, you know, just two days ago, India made a big noise saying that, you know, CPEC is illegal and then, you know, they wanted foreign nations to join in for CPEC to sort of basically to uh, get money because Pakistan is having problems repaying China for CPEC. Indeed, uh, indeed, so, Ram. In fact, uh, uh, just a few hours back, I was speaking to former diplomat uh, uh, Sashank, and he was uh, mentioning that uh, uh, given the economic uh, condition of Pakistan, which is very precarious, uh, Pakistani Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif uh, has been visiting Saudi Arabia and America uh, with a begging bowl, we can say, and uh, they are, uh, uh, and China is not at all coming to the rescue of Pakistan while uh, the economy is uh, just uh, uh, getting uh, worse uh, day after day, and which has been the case with uh, uh, Sri Lanka also. What uh, uh, former diplomat Sashank was saying that uh, given the precarious economic situation of Pakistan, mm -hmm. somehow Russia and uh, other countries may persuade Islamabad uh, to allow the shipment of the goods uh, from Karachi, uh, let it go to Bombay, and uh, let the uh, our, uh, the port which India has built in Iran, northeastern parts of Iran, Chabahar, uh, be used for uh, the purposes of the uh, transport of the shipments. Uh, since uh, we also need uh, a redressal of our energy insecurity, we are now importing a lot of uh, oil and gas uh, from Russia. So, do you think uh, mm -hmm. that in the uh, in, in the in the backdrop? Uh, of the worsening economic situation of Pakistan and its former, the China's former allies, uh, the, the window opens somehow for an alternative uh, uh, sort of thing? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, it is very unlikely that, you know, Pakistan will suddenly uh, uh, open up its uh, land for transport of goods to, let's say, from Central Asia to uh, uh, India, because that would be, you know, that would, that the, uh, the political parties who are, who are not in power, the opposition would say that, look, here is Pakistan succumbing to Indian, uh, to Indian pressure. Every time something like that has happened, the military has kept in and, you know, that they would see it as a thing. But here's the interesting thing. Uh, we don't really need Pakistan anymore uh, for this, uh, you know, uh, transport of goods. Once this North-South International Corridor comes into place, and this North-South International Corridor, which is coming in from Russia all the way down to uh, through some of these Central Asian states into Iran, and then from there to India, is interesting in another way. It also bypasses the Suez Canal. See, now the Suez Canal, as you know, can be sort of squeezed by the Western powers. Um, you can't squeeze Chabahar, you can't squeeze uh, Bandar Abbas. So it's a very, you know, already some goods have been shipped. And this is a very interesting corridor. They've just opened it up. I think some potty tons or something of some goods came in already. It comes in from uh, Russia, uh, into Iran, across the... Um, what sea is that? It's called the, uh, oh, I just remembered the sea. It's called, uh, one second. Um, it's, it's, it's that closed sea, which, which, which doesn't, uh, okay. you know, uh, doesn't why, am I, why am I forgetting? It'll come to me. <laughs> so, um, 
so now that is that you know the problem with that is that the moment that comes into play the moment that comes into play the americans and the west are going to have a major problem because a russia is involved iran is involved both are enemies of the west right now of the us rather than the west okay b what is happening is that because you are bypassing the mediterranean and because you are bypassing the swiss canal and everything and making this route some europeans have also even seen interest saying that hey you know we could use the same route to ship goods right down to the indian ocean and you know into the arabian sea and ship it would be a lot cheaper than us having to go all the way you know either down from the african side or even through the suez into the mediterranean it's a lot it's about 15 days less which is a lot of money saved and time saved And that is what the Americans a bit rather so they are not going to sit there and you know just let this happen. They're already trying to sort of you know threaten and cajole people, saying that no, we won't let you ship it. But this is all through Russian territory and Iranian territory. What can you do? The Americans can't do much other than you know get it. That's one part of it. So once that really gets into play, I don't think we'll really need Pakistan to sort of you know use it for shipping. See. even if pakistan were to allow us to ship things through their territory we would be in many ways you know we been thinking about a pipeline for instance from central asia through pakistan into india but every time the question comes up we say oh you know some terrorists will come and sit on it and you know after all pipeline is a pipeline you depend on it now if some terrorists come and says i'm going to block it blow it up what will you do it's going to impact you because you're further downstream ended so here this is yeah so this is going to really you know uh, uh, be another sort of a game changer in many ways ended yeah. ended ram it's, but it's uh, uh, ended i got it uh, ram i would like to draw your attention to one more uh, development um, in fact in some of the foreign journals uh, there are suggestions that china is using the sco forum uh, to develop it as a counter to g20 Uh, the, anyways, uh, uh, SU expansion is on the cards. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and and Qatar are being invited. Uh, now we are also in the in in the in an era where Cold War is reviving. The Western bloc is separate, yes. and the Russian bloc is separate. So we are in a different uh, in different uh, completely in a different ecosystem. So in that scenario, uh, India will be taking over the presidentship of SU next year. and india is taking over the presidentship of g20 later this year yes. so india india has to do a balancing act in between the western allies and uh, uh, the, the eastern european countries um, see again i wouldn't uh, really call it a balancing act though we've been doing it rather well you know we've been using both sides we've been doing it quite well we've been pushing back against the west which is something i had not seen for a very long time You know, the last time I think we saw it was after the nuclear tests in 1988. Then you said, "Do what you can do. We are going to. We have done it now. Let's see. You know, you want to sanction us? Let's go ahead and do it." But uh, and now you've been noticing that you've been telling the West where to get off. That you know you can't preach to us when you yourself are being hypocritical. And Jay Shankar has made no bones about telling it to right up to the faces. But you know, the interesting part here is. post this ukraine issue i think the entire world has realized that the main reason why the americans can sort of intimidate the rest of the world is because of the dependency on the dollar true yes okay, so now every country has the dollar as its main reserve currency so if the american starts squeezing you are in trouble so now if now because of this ukraine crisis a lot of countries are trying to say let's find an alternate to the dollar true in fact even 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 at the sco i think i think the chinese made uh, no it was lavrov who remarked that you know people should consider putting up an option now the chinese would love nothing more than to you know offer their yuan as an alternative but that's not going to happen because that's not a very stable currency in that sense they they are basically currency manipulators correct but um, you know i think there is a move on to sort of you know find an alternate to the dollar and once that happens that's going to again have huge repercussions because a lot of countries will then start divesting their dollars in a, in exchange for the whatever this new currency is and that's going to put the americans on the back foot and so, so again 
again, the Americans are going to have a bit of a, you know, do a bit of a juggling act. The main reason that, you know, uh, the Ukraine crisis has sort of, uh, has sort of exposed, the main thing is the, is the powerful use of the dollar. So even the Europeans, even, even a lot of African countries, even a lot of other countries which are theoretically pro-West have realized that, you know, if tomorrow the Americans suddenly decide that they don't like us, they can use the same thing against us. And we are totally dependent on the dollar as a, as a currency of, you know, reserve. So now a lot of countries, while they're saying, no, you know, we're not interested, they are evincing interest. In fact, even to break the sanctions that are going on now, you know, because Europe needs its energy. I mean, that's where the hypocritical part comes in, that they are going to import their gas and they're going to tell <laughs> India not to. That's, you know, that's not going yeah, to happen. So even they are using or making, let's say, putting out feelers that, okay, what other alternate is there? What can be put up as a competition to the dollar? And that's, again, I suspect that the Americans know about it and they're, they're you know, trying to figure out how they can use it. But it might not happen today or tomorrow because the dollar is still very, very powerful. But I think we are headed towards that. And that's, again, going to really change the global you know, dynamics in a huge way. It won't be the ruble. It won't be the yuan. In fact, the reason why we sort of, you know, made the rupee recently, if you remember, we were allowed it to be globally traded. Yes. He was never on that thing. So now that too is an interesting sign. I think we are also saying that could be the rupee. It won't be, but, you know, and just putting it out there that, okay, it could be. So I think we're looking at very interesting times coming up, you know, because so slowly but surely it may not happen immediately. Slowly but surely, the Americans are being sort of challenged. And it's about time because, you know, uh, I recently I did an interview. It's called, what, what was it called? Some virtue signaling. The phrase is okay. called virtue signaling, where you say that whatever I'm doing, I'm a good person. So whatever I'm doing, it's for the global good. So hence, you can't blame <laughs> me. And huh. I can go and, you know, bomb Iraq out of the smithereens and later on say, oh, sorry, wrong number. But I'm a good person, you know, I'm on the good side. So you can't blame me, which is why nobody calls George Bush Correct. a uh, terrorist. But Correct. technically, and you're calling, uh, you know, uh, Putin a terrorist. Correct. Now, I, I have been sort of, you know, a bit puzzled by that because, you know, if I, just because it's, it's, it's a nice phrase, what you signal it. In fact, mm. uh, after this, I just responded. I was interviewed on this subject by some. I'll send you the my answers to that. Huh. Uh, it's it's a nice thing. Excellent. And it works. It really works. Indeed, that that is but the reality that we have seen. And, we said mm. and we've caught on to it, and so now we're saying no, you can't do what you're signaling to us. And you know, just because you say you're good and I'm on the right side, so you should support me, not going to happen. We will Correct. look at it carefully, dispassionately, see what it what we get from it, and only then we'll be supported. Definitely, uh, Ram. Let's let's, um, let's take another um, uh, aspect which uh, which was uh, uh, deliberated at the SCO summit, and that is the food uh, crisis and the energy crisis. Um, so uh, we yes. know that uh, about thirty five million tons of food grains were lying in Ukraine, and uh, now they have uh, signed an agreement in uh, uh, probably in Qatar, I suppose. In Qatar, they signed the agreement. Uh, Qatar is uh, acting as the place where they are uh, all mediator there. that uh, the food yeah. grains shipment would be allowed from Ukraine. Uh, but um, uh, right. uh, we are in a big uh, mess because uh, India has been you know, reaching out uh, uh, food grains to very poor countries which have been suffering mm -hmm. because of the food crisis. So uh, do you think that uh, this food crisis is going to be resolved in the next few months uh, because Russia isn't going back from Ukraine? Things would get only worse. Um, see, the food crisis is something that I, I in my personal opinion, I, I think that Russia plans to squeeze Europe and punish it for aligning against it. So moment if they decide to cut off gas supply. Then... Uh, your video has frozen, Ram. Uh, uh, 
I think we have some uh, connection issue with Ram and uh, we hope to get back him soon. Uh, uh, friends, uh, let me uh, throw a little more light uh, on the SEO Summit uh, that uh, uh, um, Jashankar briefed the SEO members about uh, India's humanitarian aids in Afghanistan. And uh, you may recall that uh, the Joint Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs, J.P. Singh, had recently gone to Kabul and made contacts uh, with the leadership of Taliban there. And thereby, uh, we, we have renewed our contact in, uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, friends, uh, Afghanistan is a very uh, critical nation for India's strategic interest uh, because uh, uh, Pakistan in the last uh, two decades had built uh, strategic uh, depth out there and uh, uh, was working against the interest of India. They were pushing terrorists in Kashmir. But uh, uh, Pakistan also has been hit uh, very badly by, uh, by the groups uh, which uh, break away from the main Taliban. There are various offshoots uh, within the northwestern frontier of uh, Pakistan and they had been uh, fighting it out on the border, Durand border again is a very sensitive issue for the new Taliban regime and uh, there had been a lot of uh, skirmishes happening on uh, a Durand line between Pakistan and Afghanistan. In that context, India has uh, opened its channel back in Kabul, which is uh, which is only a logical thing because we have to protect our strategic interests. But still, uh, the challenge remains because uh, Taliban, how much we can trust remains a question because uh, there are no visible signs that uh, the current uh, uh, Taliban is uh, better than the previous avatar. So in that context, uh, Jashankar briefed uh, the SEO members uh, about... Uh, the humanitarian aids India has provided uh, to Afghanistan in the recent times. Now, uh, Ram is back. Hi, Ram. Welcome back. So, Ram is back. Uh, Ram, we are not getting your audio. So, uh, let's get uh, Ram. Uh, audio is not working. So, while Ram gets back to us, uh, I was giving you a brief idea about Jashankar's briefing to the SEO members about India's uh, humanitarian uh, works in Afghanistan. You may be knowing, friends, that India, in times of crisis, has reached out about four billion US dollars of uh, uh, credit line to Sri Lanka also, even while China uh, extended just about 75 million US dollars of help to uh, Sri Lanka. Even uh, uh, Pakistan, which is uh, said to be all weather ally of uh, China, is struggling with its economy and China is not at all coming. No, Ram, uh, audio is not coming. Uh, Ram, I cannot hear your audio. There are some audio issues. Uh, no, no, Ram. Audio issues uh, are there. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, give a, a little more brief. Yeah. Uh, ha, Ram, now I can hear you. Excellent. So yeah. Ram is back now. Okay, great. I'm, I'm so sorry. I think the power just went and my whole uh, system just crashed. Doesn't something. matter. So, so you, were, you were saying mm -hmm. something. Can you complete now uh, what you were saying? Yes. Um, what I was saying is that, you know, um, the interesting part here is that why did India stop exporting food grains. It wasn't because we didn't want to share or we didn't want. What was happening was the various countries were importing from us and holding and then hoping to sell later at a price to somebody else. Indeed. Who yes. really needed it. And we didn't want that to happen. That was the reason why we stopped. So we had excess food grains. If there is a crisis, I'm sure we'll be more than happy to share. After that, after ensuring, of course, that we have enough to feed our own people first. So, but we have had reasonable, I mean, fairly reasonable stocks of food grains and stuff. And uh, I think we'll be more than happy to share. Now, here's the other thing that, that is of interest here. Uh, while we were sort of, you know, having this conference here, there's a Chinese vessel which is headed towards Sri Lanka. And India is True. again getting into a thing. Why am I connecting the two? Because every time, every time that there has been 
a meeting between the Indian and Chinese uh, leadership. The Chinese have tried to provoke us in in some way or the other at some other place. You know, whenever, uh, uh, whenever even when we had those informal meetings in Wuhan and in what was the other place where we had the, the meetings uh, uh, between Xi and uh, Modi. Uh, there was a virtual meeting uh, like, over the BRICS. Yeah, yeah. But no, no, before that, when, when we had a bilateral meeting, when, you know, the informal yes, meeting, yes, yes. They, they, had yes, the, yes. Huh. they had two of them, one in India, one in, one in China, where, you know, we went into it. But after that, all this Galwan happened. Now, the thing here is, every time that the two leaders meet, there is some incident either on the border or some other incident somewhere which provokes us. Now, this is a very interesting philosophy, which is, which is Chinese practice very well, and it pays off very well which is to always keep the other side guessing about your true intentions. Ended. Now, the way to explain it, explain it is that if you see a dog, you know, which is snarling, but its tail is wagging, which end do you believe? Ended. You know? <laughs> hmm. Which end do you believe? You say, oh, its tail is wagging, so it's a friendly dog, but it's snarling, but it's an unfriendly dog. Yes. So it obviously keeps you guessing. Now, that is Ended. the objective because if you're guessing, if you're guessing, that means you're on the back foot. You don't know how to react because, you know, you're faced with two options. Now, the Chinese Ended. have mastered that. The Pakistanis have picked up from this, this trick from the Chinese and they do the same thing. So every time there's a meeting, there's some incident on the border, some but some terrorist incident, either, you know, before or after. It's a, unfortunately, it, it, it still works. Ended. Unfortunately. Ended. Even Ram, if you we know have... all about it, even if you know. Yeah. yeah tell uh, me. Ram, we have about uh, Ram. five more minutes left. Ha, we, we just have five more minutes left. Uh, we'll, uh, we want to yeah. go to the lighter parts. Uh, we have been on a very tell serious uh, issue. Uh, Central, uh, Central, Asian, Central Asian countries, uh, we have mm -hmm. deep cultural ties with Central Asian countries. Uh, true, from, uh, uh, from Ashokan time uh, to Akbar's time, we had uh, relations with the Central Asian countries and even mm -hmm. Raj Kapoor's uh, films and songs are very popular there and people are so happy about um, India. A lot of uh, students from India go Ooh. and study there. So how do you Ooh. see these Central Asian countries um, uh, working in mm -hmm. the interests of India? See, there was a time when all this was very much so. In fact, I had gone if I, I had gone with different uh, who did I go with to Tashkent? I had gone to Tashkent about 15 years ago, and the taxi driver started playing Raj Kapoor songs in the car. <laughs> okay, and he was actually humming along, saying Mera Juta Japani in a very Russian accent. Uh -huh. you know? but, but I think that that sort of people to people contact has not been as strong now as it was in the earlier days, as it was okay. during the Soviet times. Okay. It's slowly fading because of various factors, you know, because language, religious sentiments have come into play. A lot of these stuns, as we call them, you know, they're now, it's no longer the Soviet Union, it's all so many stuns. A lot of them have started believing that we are sort of, you know, intimidating Muslims, we are, you know, mistreating Muslims. Turkey has played a big role in sort of, you know, feeding this fear into. So while there is an undercurrent amongst the slightly older generation, the younger generation, unfortunately, does not seem to have that connect with India that their fathers did. Okay, you know? that's interesting. So, and, and that's quite sad. That's quite sad because we do have, you know, uh, I mean, right from a long, long time, we've had a very nice relationship with them. You know, we've always been happy to host people from Central Asia to come and study here, to come and, you know, work here. It's now slowly becoming difficult. At the same time, at the same time, I wouldn't say it's totally gone, but I would say that there's a generation that's coming up now which doesn't have the same connect that their forefathers did with India. Ended. You know? And that's sad. That, that's, that's not a very happy thought. But then that applies even to Russia. I mean, you and I, we, we, we used to get Sputnik and all that stuff at home, if you remember, right? We used to get exactly, that exactly. Sputnik, if you remember. Ex exactly. Do you see that anymore? You don't. No, no. You don't. No. 
how many indians now want to be given a choice how many of them could go to russia to study they don't they go, go to the us or you um, know some other english speaking country canada yes canada america yeah, yeah. hmm yeah so so True. that that relationship is slowly you know that people to people thing it can be revived in fact both sides are keen to revive it but it's not happening as uh, the way it way it should you know it, it's it's there is an element that okay yes a lot of people think that we should still trust russia which is true because it has stood by us when we were in times of trouble starting from the 71 war to you know other times uh they are the only country that has given us nuclear submarines to actual nuclear submarines on which to practice and train our, our navy no other exactly. country has done that despite all the big talk about sharing so you know the taste of the pudding as they say is in the eating that you know um so russia is a good friend and we shouldn't just disown russia just because the americans are putting pressure on us or somebody else is saying that we will give you something it's a time tested friendship exactly. but at the same time the friendship has which used to be based on a people to people on a, on a you know thing that that is slowly eroding and i'm i'm sad to say that 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 but that that's a truth that's a truth Exactly. Now here's the other thing. A lot of people are saying, "Oh, Russia is aligning with China, and hence, you know, how can our friend align with China?" But here's the thing: every time we have met diplomatically, both India and Moscow, I mean New Delhi and Moscow, have repeatedly reinforced that it is not a, a either or relationship. Ended. That you know, if I'm friends with China, that doesn't mean that I'm. not friends with india or if i am friends with the american doesn't mean that i am not friends with russia it is not a one off kind of a thing it's not a trade off you know the americans have that very transactional statement that either if you're with us that means you can't be friends with that person because that guy is our enemy but i think both moscow and new delhi understand very clearly that you know you can be friends in fact it helps if you're a friend of i mean you might not like somebody i might like that person But does Indeed. that mean you and I can't be friends? Of course. And you know, both sides have been reinforcing that. And I would also argue that right now Russia needs China in some way, but the relationship is not the relationship that they have with India. Exactly. You know, it's it's again the Chinese believe in a relationship where they are superior, where they have an economic hold over you, and that's what they have with Russia and even now. And the Russians are not very comfortable with that. I mean, even now, you know, uh, the Russians are asking for investments, saying that you know India wants to invest in Russia. We want you to, and they have a lot of these oil things happening in their Far East, which is in the you know Arctic Circle side. They're not letting the Chinese come in. They're saying no. We we want to give it to India. Okay, interesting. You know, interesting. So. I think both sides have made it very clear that just because I am friends with your enemy doesn't mean I can't be friends with you. Ended. These are the aspects which are which are not uh, um, enough in the public domain in the country in India particularly. Uh, of late, I see that uh, uh, the media coverage and the media analysis in India is mostly leaning to the Western countries' narrative uh, that is uh, bashing Russia. Uh, but ram uh, there is one more challenge 80% of our defense goods are sourced from russia and given the kind of uh, mm-hmm. relationship that china and russia are having and given the expertise mm-hmm. of china in backward engineering of defense goods and uh, engineering products don't you think in right. the event of uh, indo china war in future if that possibility ever materializes we will be at a disadvantage mm-hmm. uh, for leaning only on mm-hmm. russia Mm, well yes and no you see um let's face it both both india and china are nuclear powers so is russia and it number 1 number 2 um so you know i mean of course nobody really wants a war i don't think china wants a war with us right now i don't think we india wants a war because they set set both of us back economically in a big way even if we don't go nuclear And okay, if there is a war, but but why don't we look at it in a different way? Why don't we look at it that Russia could actually step in and act as a mediator in case there is a war? Because see, Russia is friendly with China too, and Russia is friendly with India too. Indeed. Why should we always assume that Russia will, you know, 
align with uh, China if push comes to shove? Why, why should we not assume that it will align with us? I mean, the fact that Russia is saying that, you know, we want to give our oil and other gas reserves the first option to India is a sign that, that you know, you see, I, I'm being politically incorrect here, but the Russians are a bit racist in some ways. Okay. Okay, with India, they have a long cultural relationship so that we are sort of, you know, almost uh, excluded, but um, they don't like being dictated to by China, which is what China is trying to do. Indeed. And they don't like the fact that, you know, economically they're indebted to China. They don't like the fact, but right now they don't say, they don't have an option. Who else can they align with? The Americans and the West are all totally aligned against them. The other part of it is that Russia and China share a, what, I think almost four and a half thousand kilometer border. Yes. Indeed. Now, if you have a border like that, it allows you to trade very easily no matter what sanctions, whatever there is. You just have to cross, sure. you know, send things across the border. Who can stop you without sort of, you know, encroaching into your territory? So Indeed. in many ways, right now, Russia needs China. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Russia likes China. Indeed. Interesting perspective. Definitely. So in that way, uh, uh, India will be a key pivot uh, in the coming years. And given uh, the G20 presidentship uh, that India will be taking up uh, later this year, where Russia is also a member, along with the Americans uh, and the Western countries. Um, uh, still, right. uh, uh, still in the post-pandemic and the post-Ukrainian uh, uh, world order, many things are mm -hmm. happening which are, which are shocks. Just now we saw that in Tunisia, an authoritarian ruler is coming, uh, taking the whole power there. Arab Spring is dying yes. there. Russia, uh, Sri Lanka is crumbling. Pakistan is in a dire strait. So a lot of new things are happening. Quite an exciting time in the international relations. There's, a, there's an old Chinese, they call it a proverb, but it's actually a curse, which says, may you live in interesting times. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> and uh, I think we are living, we are getting on to even more interesting times. And, you know, huh. it's fascinating to see how, how uh, things are turning out. Huh. Ended. And I can tell you the Americans are not going to give up without a fight. And I can tell you that the Americans are going to be a superpower for a long time, even now. No matter how hard the Chinese try, the Americans still outgun them, outclass them in various ways. Okay, Ended. but the alignments are changing. The alignments mm. are changing. It's no longer just the Western dominated construct anymore. People are saying that why should we, and this is what China wanted, saying that, you know, why should we always stick to what the West did after World War II and divided the world into camps? But unfortunately, it's not breaking down the way China wanted either, because there's a lot of now suspicion about China. Partly with Correct. all this debt trap and what happened to Sri Lanka and other places. So that suspicion is going to cause problems for China, no matter how hard they try. Even, even Pakistan is, you know, is getting a bit irritated because the Chinese are squeezing, saying, I want my money. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so, so, so it's and, uh, Ch China, China never forgives its money. China never forgets its money. China never forgives its uh, uh, the loanee. Uh, uh, Ram, let's uh, wrap it up. Uh, this was our first interactive uh, video in, uh, on, a, on a serious issue of uh, the SEO Summit. And uh, we hope that uh, on weekends we'll be able to do uh, such sort of interactive video where we'll uh, get uh, uh, good uh, uh, experts to talk in, on big issues of the day. And uh, Ram has been very kind to join us. Uh, he has been an expert, happy. and we have been more than happy. Past. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, friends, uh, let's wind it up. Uh, thank you so much for joining, and uh, do share the link with your friends. We'll keep uh, doing this. Do uh, and thank sure. you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ram. Good night. Bye bye. Bye. Good, Good night. night. Bye.